Okay, up next is uh, Andrew Watson. And as you may have seen, there's nobody rushing forward to take the uh, presentation because unfortunately Andrew couldn't make it today. So I've been subbed in to read his paper on his behalf. Um, uh, Andrew's a, a third year PhD candidate at the University of Glasgow. His research is primarily a critique of the uses of phenomenology within archaeology. And a case study is how we may be able to better utilize it for archaeologists in the future. Okay, so this is what this paper will cover today. Today I'm going to be demonstrating my phenomenological approach, SAS methodology, using the well-known Long Barrow of Wes Kennett. I will briefly discuss three days of field work I've undertaken there and how this has led me to the conclusion on where I believe that we, as practitioners, should be heading with phenomenology. To set the scene for work that has come before this, I'll briefly cover the four high-level approaches to phenomenology we've had within our discipline, I'll then discuss the field work I have undertaken, along with some analysis, before suggesting how this could be beneficial going forward. Romden Romluck uh, stated that phenomenology means different things to each phenomenologist, and this is no different in archaeology. Tilly stated that phenomenology involves the understanding and description of things as they are experienced by a subject. Hamilton et al. stated uh, phenomenology is concerned with sensory aspects of past human experience that cannot be easily addressed by traditional archaeological methods. But for me, a phenomenological account is a descriptive account of a phenomenon as unveiled to and experienced by the perceiver. So now that I've set my point of departure, let us consider the four strands of phenomenological investigation in archaeology to date. So I believe these four approaches could be broadly defined as the following. The Tilly-esque approach, which has been well discussed elsewhere. The Cummings and Whittle approach, where we have observations for monuments and drawings of the landscape. Then there's the more progressive Hamilton et al. approach, with a clear aim, explicit methodology, results and conclusion. And most recently, the augmented phenomenological approach by Stuart Eve. While Marshall did not claim his work on residents within Long Barrows was phenomenological, it certainly falls into the category of sensory archaeology as well. Okay, oh, geez. still on this one. Uh, <laughs> let's briefly take each one in turn. Uh, without Tilly, we may not hopefully be enjoying this short paper on phenomenology and potentially this session on sensory archaeology. So I think it's important to read his work in the context of someone who has brought the subdiscipline of philosophy into the archaeological circles. However, his work lacks the methodological rigor needed. I'm not going to discuss that in much detail here, but would suggest reading the works of Fleming, Barrett and Co. or Brooke to get a deeper understanding of the wider critiques. But what is missing is an understanding of how his work was carried out in the field. Was it simply more than simply noting correlations as he walked through the landscape? Does the viewpoint of one well-educated person, which is critiqued by others as well, give us a fair representation of people's engagement with a monument? How can one person's account create an imaginatively interpreted account of a prehistoric monument as he would go on to claim 14 years later? Cumming and Whittle's work took a slightly different approach to Tilly's phenomenology of landscape in that they used more photography and drawings in the field to reach their conclusions. However, their conclusions were more landscape correlations observed from a prehistoric monument and less about the phenomenological experience of traveling through a landscape or experiences at a site. We then had the Hamilton et al. approach, which I should hope to get correct given the fellow speakers in this session. This was one of the first to give an explicit methodology regarding uh, their work in the Tavalira Gagano region in Italy. This study was one of the first phenomenological studies to go beyond simple visual analysis and consider smell, sound and movement through the landscape. Eve's work on the dead man's eyes and dead man's nose is really exciting and innovative work using GIS, GPS and other forms of digital, digital technology. Eve has created apps to place, for example, prehistoric houses on Lesnick Hill. The users hold a tablet up to the horizon, and using points in the landscape, the app will overlay the houses onto that landscape. Similarly, his dead man's nose approach uses a similar type of technology. Mixed with a box with four fans, it releases smells to enhance his one's experience at a certain location. For example, at the Bronze Age cyst grave in Denmark, Eve's dead man nose emitted a cold smoke smell. The device can apparently emit up to 100 different predefined smells. 
There's no doubt that Eve's work is pushing the boundaries of both phenomenology and digital heritage and enabling us to get a better understanding of what people's experience may have been like at the time in question. However, is it true to phenomenology? What do these four studies have at the center of them? An archaeologist as the participant, researcher and publisher. So my thought was, let's remove the archaeologist. After all, if phenomenology is, quote, a descriptive account of a phenomenon as unveiled to and experienced by the perceiver, end quote, that perceiver does not and should not be me. I've briefly looked across several other disciplines to see how their studies are formed and note that we are the, one of the only disciplines to be both a researcher and publisher of our work. Medicine uses patients while the researchers are independent. In education, the same is true between pupils and researchers. But to delve into the philosophy of phenomenology, can I suspend all my preconceptions of the world uh, and a monument and simply be at that monument and be within that landscape? I think not. What I can do, however, is to facilitate documenting the engagement of participants and critically an analyze their observations. So this is what we did. The field work was undertaken at West Kent at Long Barrow. Forming part of the Stonehenge, Avebury and Associated Sites World Heritage Site, West Kennet is one of the longest and best surviving examples of a Cotswold 7 Long Barrow, notwithstanding the modern remedial work that has been un undertaken over the last half century. So, we took three groups of participants with us on separate days to West Kennet Long Barrow. Group 1 were four members of the public who were engaged with Long Barrows as they had purchased a niche on one of the modern prehistoric inspired columbariums. They visited the Long Barrow on a clear day with good visibility and when it was reasonably warm. Of the four participants, only one had visited this barrow before. For those of you who may not have come across one before, uh, this is the Long Barrow All Kennings. It's a prehistoric inspired columbarium uh, developed by Tim Dorr. Um, the barrow is situated just over six kilometres to the southeast of West Kennet, on the other side of the Pusey Downs. Um, inside it has five chambers uh, with numerous niches. Here we are. Um, one of which is where the participants in this focus group or their loved ones will be placed when they pass. The barrow has sold out and inspired uh, several others to be constructed across England and one planned for Scotland. Uh, group two were four members of the public who had previously not visited the barrow. On this day, the weather was overcast with moderate visibility. And group three was formed of three archaeologists, two of whom had visited the barrow numerous times before. The weather on this day was very wet and windy. So maybe that's foreboding the, uh, the later uh, analysis. Um, <laughs> at the barrow, each of the groups uh, were asked six simple questions. Um, what had it been like to spend time at West Canada today? What was your impression when you first saw the barrow? What was it like when you first entered the barrow? After spending time here, has anything changed the way you feel, interpret or engage with the site? Has there been any area of the barrow, inside or out, that has made you feel different? And why do you think this is? And what does West Kennet mean to you? These questions may seem simple, but at their core is the intent of understanding the phenomenon at the point in time in which they were exposed to it, and to aid them in giving a descriptive account of their experience. Participants were able to choose where to have their interviews conducted. Participants on days one and two, groups one and two, chose outside the barrow on the northeastern side. The archaeologists chose the western chamber, most likely due to the weather. So what did we observe? Um, there's not sufficient time to go through each question individually, but what follows is a general overview of what, people, of what each of the groups said. Group one, uh, one participant felt a strong desire to engage with the past and to, quote, walk in ancestral footsteps. This was a recurring theme between those in groups one and two. The next participant felt uncomfortable within the barrow, and while, they, uh, and while not what they expected, they were happy to have been there, but did not have a desire to return. Another participant in this group found it a more enjoyable experience than their first visit some years prior. They noted how visiting it at the end of a long day in the rain made it less pleasant than the day that they visited this time around. Finally, one participant noted that when they first saw the barrow, they felt, quote, like, this was reality. This was not the way we live now because we think of everything as being instant. And this is much more where life is. This is, well, nobody talks about death, but this is the land, the view, and somewhere to rest. Group two. This group all commented on the architecture of the barrow, wondering how it was constructed. How was the stone brought here? How was it built? 
In this group, we did have one person who was in a trade and another who built their own house. Um, does this begin to show us how our past experiences affect our engagement with the monument? What was interesting is to note that two participants in this group felt a distinct unease at being in the barrows, using the word, using words such as eerie to describe their time in there. However, the other two participants felt that they were able to engage with the past while in the barrow. What is noteworthy here is that the two participants who felt uncomfortable uh, were our two youngest, and those who wanted to engage were two of our older uh, participants. However, what was clear was that all the participants in this group wanted to learn more about the barrow, but felt that information was lacking at the site itself. Group three. Of the participants, two had visited the barrow before. The one that had not had engaged with it digitally through the TV series, Children of the Stones, and knew about the site in general. For one participant, they felt as though their visit uh, on the day was half research and half uh, uh, looking at the monument with their work hat on. They noted that it was nice to spend more relaxed time in the barrow, not working or being a kind of tour guide for others. However, they were giving the barrow a closer inspection and wondering if there was anything to report to the curator and what they should include about the barrow in a forthcoming report. For another, it was about revisiting a site that had been too many times before. Since then, they had undertaken degrees which discussed the barrow, and in turn, they were putting that knowledge into practice, looking at the wider landscape. The final participant was the only one to discuss about, uh, about how the barrow made them feel on the day, and that they felt their experience was enhanced the more time that they spent in the barrow. So what does this show us? Each participant in a group was exposed to the same phenomenon as the others in their group, yet most had very different experiences. Some engaged with it and noted about how it made them think and feel about reality, whereas others described it as eerie. We had participants considering the sheer size of the barrow, how it was built, how materials could have been brought to the location. They considered some of it a mystery. And then we had participants who were coming with research hats on and contextualizing what they had previously learned. If our aim is to give a descriptive account of a phenomenon that is an unveiled, will I be ever be able to see in West Kennet in any other light than my previously experiences? Yes, Herschel suggests we bracket this by undertaking an endetic reduction. However, how can this truly be executed? Spaces, places, landscape and monuments mean different things to different people. A graveyard in Edinburgh is where my father was laid to rest, but I ask, would you have the same connection to that cemetery as me? Would you potentially see it as a rich source of local history, a directory of the late residents of the area, or as one participant in this research stated, an eerie place? Who would be in the best position to give an account of that place? We are not people of the Neolithic, and our experiences today cannot begin to replicate that. However, and this is where the twist comes, documenting the range of these experiences we all have at this monument will benefit archaeologists in the future. Instead of wondering how people engaged with them almost 4,000 years ago, they can in turn look back and see how we engage with them in the 21st century. If phenomenology is about documenting our experience of a phenomena as it's unveiled to us, there is little point or decency in trying to claim our experience as being anything as like that in the Neolithic. However, we can benefit archaeologists of the future. Tilly outlined his seven steps of phenomenological research including visiting the Barrow location numerous times and from different route ways, and then, quote, drawing together all of these observations and experiences in the form of a synthetic text and imaginatively interpreting them in the times, terms of possi possible prehistoric life worlds. However, as I have demonstrated, there is a potential the more we know of the site, the less we engage with it. The more we experience a phenomenon, the more resilient and passive we become of it. We know that we will feel, uh, we know how we will feel and what to expect. Should we then have more of a childish, inquisitive approach that Robert McFarlane talks about in his book Landmarks when we visit landscapes and monuments? The excitement of a new place, the wonder of what is behind each stone. I believe the earlier studies have been beneficial. Perhaps we now need to stop and change direction. Is it about imagining prehistoric life worlds? Are we best placed to do this? Or is it about documenting how these monuments appear to us today? About how we engage with them today to benefit archaeological, uh, archaeologists of the future? It was Tilly who stated that, quote, the skin of the landscape has gone for good, but not its shape. The bones of the land, the mountain hills, rocks and valleys, escarpments and ridges have remained substantially the same. We can all probably think of uh, examples where the landscape has changed or been modified over millennia, Sticking with Neolithic long barrows, there's an example of this at the Fairy's Foot in Somerset. 
Um, this is the map of the site of the Ferry's Foot. Um, the Ferry's Foot is another Cotswold 7 barrow located in the parish of Newport Throbwell in Somerset. It's about three kilometres mm. south southeast of Bristol Airport. Um, if you're at Ferry's Foot and you walk 30 metres south, then Blagdon Lake comes into view. This is Blagdon Lake here. This image shows uh, a GIS view shared of the barrow, and as we can see, it's primarily the landscape to the southwest north and northwest that are visible from the barrow itself. Move 30 metres south of the barrow and a lot more of the vista comes into view uh, to the southwest, along with views of Blackton Lake. This OS map shows slightly clearer the relationship of the barrow to the lake. However, uh, this lake was not so prior to 1905 and was in fact known as the River Yale. Originally known as the Yale uh, Reservoir, this now covers some 440 acres and has, commonly, and has now commonly been known as Blackton Lake. So what is the significance of this example? If we were took a phenomenological account of the fairy's foot in 1885, for example, it would have been a wholly different to that that we carried out today. Why? Because of the changing skin of the landscape. So applying this logic to some of the different kinds of phenomenology, if the skin of the landscape changes, can we ever begin to imagine what it was like during the Neolithic? Potentially, yes, if you include historical sources or computer-generated simulations, historical texts or other kinds of analysis. However, is this in the spirit of philosophical phenomenology? I suggest not, and as such, my definition states that phenomenology is uh, a descriptive account of a phenomena as unveiled to and experienced by the perceiver. And maybe we should also add to that definition uh, at a given point in time. Our accounts of the West Kennet Long Barrow do not tell us what it may have been like in the Neolithic, but what we can do is use phenomenology to explicitly detail perceivers' engagement with the monument today. This in turn allows us for a snapshot of the life of the monument in 2019 and what it means to the perceivers who have experienced the phenomenon. If phenomenon, phenomenology cannot help us to engage the with the past, then it is a starting point for the future. Sorry. In summary, phenomenology is not a tool to help us understand how people in prehistory experience the site or landscape. It's a tool to help us document our experiences and engagement today for the archaeologists of tomorrow. Thank you very much.